Hello and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. I'm Jungles. Coming up this week, it's the latest Nintendo classic to hit the Wii. Mario Kart. It's got bananas, it's got red shells, but how does it fare against rubber chickens? Also a sneak preview of Prototype. It's an open world game where you are the weapon. We also chat to one of its developers who just so happens to be an Aussie. Plus Castlevania for the PSP and we examine the history of ninjas in video games. But first, can you guess the game for this week? A little bit different this time. We want you to name the famous racing track that this music is famous for. Answer at the end of the show. Quick sticks done, news time, go! Whee! Oh, don't forget the lizard! Good game. The winners of the sixth annual Media Connect IT Journalism Awards have been announced in a ceremony held in Sydney recently. The bronze frilled necked lizard statuettes, or Lizzies as they are affectionately known, are given out each year to celebrate the best in technology journalism. This year's winners included Seamus Byrne, who took away a Lizzie for Best Gaming Journalist, PC Powerplay, who took out the award for Best Gaming Title, and GameSpot.com.au, who won for Best New Title. The biggest winners for the night, though, were Ben Woodhead, who picked up two gongs, one for Best Industry Journalist and a second for Best Journalist Overall, as well as gaming television show Good Game, which picked up an award for the Best Multimedia Coverage, as well as winning the coveted Gold Lizzie for being the Best Title Overall. European gamers got more than one rude shock in the past week when the launch details of the much-anticipated rock band were revealed by the game's publisher, Electronic Arts. The first unpleasant surprise was that PAL territories will not receive an all-inclusive rock band bundle. Instead, the instruments and the game disc will only be sold separately. The second bombshell was the price. The instrument pack will clock in at 130 British pounds, approximately 277 Aussie dollars, while the game will set Euro gamers back 50 pounds, a further 100 Aussie dollars. That means PAL gamers will pay more than double the game's North American price. The only good news so far is that the PAL version of Rock Band will feature at least nine playable songs that were not included in the North American release, including tracks from Blur, Oasis, and Muse. We talked to an Australian Electronic Arts representative, but no further details were available on either an Australian launch date or price. In more Electronic Arts news, the publisher has surprised us again, only this time it's a surprise of the pleasant kind. In mid-March, rumors were rife that the latest game in the Battlefield series, Battlefield Bad Company, would feature five weapons that would only become available if players paid for them and downloaded them. The rumors caused uproar amongst Battlefield fans, who were understandably upset at having to pay extra in microtransactions to get content that should have been included in the full game. In response to the fan reaction, the game's developer, DICE, have announced that the five weapon pack will be available to download for free, and that all five of them will come preloaded in the special gold edition of the game. If there was ever a game which has done the rounds on all the consoles, it's Castlevania. From NES to PC Engine to Commodore 64, they've all had a run-in with the Belmont's fight against Dracula. Seven months ago, a remake of Rondo of Blood was released for PSP in America, called Castlevania Dracula X Chronicles, but for some reason it's only just arrived in Australia. Junk, you know vampires only travel by boat. We can only assume the same as for vampire games. But you're right, you know, it's another one of those region-free games that just took way too long to get here. However, it's now here, and it's time for Aussies to grab the holy whip and spank some evil. You'll go up against skeletons, demons, goblins who aren't afraid of spikes, all taking place in a castle which is designed solely to frustrate you into oblivion. The game is loosely based around Dracula mythology and is now lush with 3D animations, much like what they did with Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins. But new players to the game might find the restrictive controls a little challenging at first. What about you, Badge? I heard regular frustrated grunts while you grappled evil this week. Yeah, Jung, it's kind of hard to get used to it first, and you're tempted to put the game down. However, after a while, you're reminded of the joy of success that comes from beating a retro game. You only have three lives, and every bump against an enemy hurts you. So the level of frustration is high, but the level of reward is also high as well. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said for that. Castlevania always did interesting things with platforming, where every obstacle or boss fight is a test in timing with your attacks and jumps. It does stay true to the original, so true in fact that you can actually unlock the original, as well as the next one, Symphony of the Night. Victor! I'll lend you my strength! But I can't 
can't help but wonder, Junk, why this guy can't run. Even in the most intense of situations, he's happy to smugly stroll along. I'd be legging it. He was strutting, Badger. Strutting. You can run in Symphony of the Night, which was released after Rondo, so I guess he learned his lesson. In fact, Symphony of the Night is really worth a look, especially for its inspired level design at the time. It was quite a masterpiece. Yeah, it's a shame you had to unlock these games, Badge, but I guess it fits into the whole unforgiving nature of Castlevania. And it is very unforgiving. There's plenty of ammo and power-ups, but not nearly enough health pickups. I know, Jung, I found if I died early on in a level, rather than trying to push through and beat the section, I'd quit the game and then reload my checkpoint for a better chance. And this is really a bad sign that the game hasn't evolved. Thoughts for Nolly? I reveled in the simple challenges, but it wasn't long before I was wishing for some better checkpoints. I did like how every boss, after you beat them, gave you one final attack, and that was cool. I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. Even with the new graphics, this is definitely one for the old-school platforming fans. It's a retro challenge with a cosmetic coat of the third dimension, and that is not a bad thing. I'm giving it 7.5 rubber chickens as well. Underling, why are you awake? I stay up all night to kill buffalo and collect their tusks. But why? Leader of Chinwai tribe say he'd give me new spear if I kill 30 buffalo. Mm, that sound good deal. But why you hunt tonight? Hunt tomorrow. But I want spear now. You need sleep now. And all night your mate ask me where you are. I tell her I not know. She will be mad. Tribal leader, you are truly wise. Good game. Here at Good Game, we always say we're the show for gamers by gamers. So we invited some of them along to see how the show is made. Who wants to play some games? We do! Uh, I've come from Brisbane, a up in Queensland man. Well, I just want to hang out with you guys, play a couple of games, and uh, meet some people who had something in common with me. To see how, how the show is put together, how things work behind the scenes. The studio's a lot smaller than I thought it would be, even though you said it was tiny. It's very tiny. Backwards compiled in the trivia of brilliance. So probably the game reviews. I really enjoy the game reviews. And Sage advice. Thank you. Occasionally, sage advice don't get, but most of the time, it's pretty good. Sage advice. <laughs> it's just stupid. <laughs> If you've never owned two of the most underrated consoles of all time, the Dreamcast or the GameCube, then you've probably never played Ikaruga, the vertically scrolling shoot 'em up which is notorious for its difficulty. Everything in Ikaruga has either a black or a white polarity. So long as you're in the white polarity, you'll shoot white bullets and be immune to white damage. Black enemies will also die easier. But shooting white enemies with white bullets creates a bit of white backdraft. Needless to say, all this applies to the black polarity in reverse. And since often the whole screen is full of bullets, you not only need to dodge in and out of enemy fire, but constantly change polarities for safety. And with only three lives to get through five inventive levels, the result is one of the hardest games you'll ever play. It's essential to memorize enemy movements just to survive. That in itself is a pretty sweet game, but there's more. Scoring high points requires you to kill same colored enemies in groups of three, which increases a point multiplier. It's hard, but as long as you can kill three of this, three of that, you rack up the points. But after one mistake, the multiplier drops to zero. Ikaruga's brilliance comes from forcing you to think in a different way. Usually getting a high score and winning in a game are one and the same thing. But in Ikaruga, getting a high score is actually detrimental to your safety. You have to make a constant choice whether to use the polarities as a safety shield or to go for the big points. If you can get to the end of the level, you're good. But racking up that massive combo chain, that is skill. The Xbox Live arcade version has online leaderboards, co-op, and you can also save replays. 
And if you've submitted an idea to the Good Game Game project, this might interest you. Ikaruga was made by only four people. Final thoughts, Le? Well, it's an old Dreamcast favourite and one of the hardest games you'll ever play. Shamelessly, its length is completely due to its difficulty, and some may find it a little bit too hard, but there is a trial version you can get, and it's kind of what the game's supposed to be anyway. I'm giving it 9 out of 10 rubber finches. Finches? Yeah, Ikaruga is the name of a native Japanese finch. Hmm. Nowadays, games are veering away from this 100% scripted player punishment kind of experience, but the cool levels and unique gameplay were way more than enough to ignore that. I'm giving it 9 out of 10 rubber chickeny finchy things as well. Good game. Did you ever think you were put here for a reason? Someone asked me that once. I can't remember who. I can't remember anything. Not even my name. We recently got our hands on some actual gameplay footage of Prototype, an open world action game slated for release later this year, under development by Radical. At this year's Games Developers Conference, we caught up with an Aussie working on the game, Chris Ansell, and we started by asking him just what Prototype is all about. Prototype, it's an extremely exciting project for us. Uh, the team are working on this game, and they, the last game was Hulk Ultimate Destruction. And uh, essentially, they were really keen to take a lot of the lessons from Hulk Ultimate Destruction, like the free running, the open world mechanic, the incredible combat with locomotion, and infuse it into a completely new IP, and sort of take off the handcuffs. We're basically setting the game in 2008, and you play a shapeshifter called Alex Mercer. And you're trying to get to the bottom of a large global conspiracy as to who did these terrible things to you? Why do you have these incredible powers? You're basically in the middle of it as New York essentially descends into absolute chaos from a state of normality. Was it hard to keep this, you are the weapon, was it hard to keep it fresh and interesting as you play the game? Uh, I think you get a lot of or almost free points by simply adding more systems to an open world game. So. Kind of like a microcosm, like if you have like a ball and you have a stick and you can poke it, it has a certain reaction. Well, if you had, rather than one ball, for example, pedestrians walking around, what if you added like six balls? You know, like enemy factions, uh, giant infected uh, creatures, like brawlers. What if you had like the military? What if you had thousands of cars, thousands of pedestrians across all of Manhattan? And all these are all interacting systems. So with your powers, the real fun starts to happen when, you know, with your stick, which really is you, Alex Mercer, you get to poke these systems and see how they kind of violently collide. So, and every time is different. So even when we demo the game, it's almost performance art right now, because we always see a different result every time we demo the game, which makes it, uh, you know, a joy to demo, because you can't quite rehearse it. But that's kind of where we, we see a lot of the fun coming through, is every time it's different when you play this product, which is, I think, what an open world game really should be. So that's, that's really a key component of, I think, the innovation we're trying to reach and, and trying to deliver. Lots of gore. If you like games, uh, as our lead designer Eric Holmes says, if you like games where you get to rescue kittens out of trees, this is not your game. Is there any chance it's going to get banned in Australia? We've had a few things banned lately. Well, we're working very, very closely with uh, the OFLC and with our Australian office to make sure that we obviously understand you know, where that watermark is and make sure we come under the watermark. So it's extremely important to us that Australian gamers, uh, you know, my fellow gamers, get to play this game. If you could morph your arms into anything you wanted, Badger, what would you do? Well, that's easy, John. I turn my hands into wheels like those crazy guys from Return to Oz. Those guys scared me. Yeah, me too, actually. Oh. And now over to you, Richard Vargas. Survival horror games are terrifying! You battle your way through hordes of monsters, beasts, and the undead. Against all odds, you must survive. Tonight, we're joined by Bites Nibbleton. He's a generic video game zombie. Oh, really glad to be here, Richard. Uh, so, so, Bites, do you enjoy being undead? Yeah, it's great. You get free meals, you don't need to sleep, and you're surrounded by great friends. Oh, so you're a popular guy, huh? Only in certain circles. Hey, hey guys, do you think I look fat in this shirt? Brains! Brains! Oh, you guys.
Well, do you ever- Brains! Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> huh? oh, sorry, that was my tea syndrome. It goes off like clockwork. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't mean to offend you, but- Oh, no, no, I'm used to it. You type are generally quite edgy around the living impaired. Living impaired? Y you mean zombie? Zombie? What's with the racism, man? What do you mean, racism? <laughs> Video games are renowned for their superhumanly cool characters. None more so than the ninja. Ninjas first started flipping out in video game form in the early 1980s, with games like Taito's Ninja Adventure at Dragon Castle and Sega's The Ninja kicking off a gaming obsession with Japan's black-clad feudal era assassins. Right from the start, the appeal of ninjas was irrepressible, but it wasn't until 1987 Jung, what are you doing? We're supposed to be doing the history of pirates in video games today. No, uh, today's ninjas. Didn't you get the memo? But I spent all day making this costume. No, we're doing pirates. Move over. Uh, ninja time. In 1984, the very ninja first Ninja time! Man. Looks like there's only one way we're gonna settle this! Stop, 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 stop. Pirate on ninja violence never solved anything. Let's sit down and talk about this. Yar. So, where was I? Ah yes, now 1987 was probably the most important year for ninja-related video games, with two timeless classics launching in the same year, Sega's Shinobi and System 3's The Last Ninja. Shinobi was a defining moment in the evolution of ninjas in gaming. It introduced us to Joe Musashi, a sword-slashing, shuriken-slinging super ninja who was on a mission to smash a criminal organization that kidnaps ninja children. Meanwhile, The Last Ninja appeared on the Commodore 64. This action-adventure game took players to the island of Lin Fen and put you in control of Armakuni, The Last Ninja, in a quest to have his revenge on the evil shogun who murdered his clan. Both The Last Ninja and Shinobi were hugely successful, with each game spawning several sequels in later years. But the ninja story doesn't stop there. One year later and the next big thing in ninja gaming hit arcades. It was Ninja Gaiden, a beat-em-up that put you behind the cowl of master ninja Ryu Hayabusa and had you roaming the mean streets giving some petty thugs the thrashing of their lives. Ryu's first game played more like Double Dragon than the Ninja Gaiden that we know and love today, but it was notoriously difficult, a tradition that all future games in the series would uphold. By the time Ryu Hayabusa had moved to home consoles in 1989, he looked and played very differently. Ninja Gaiden had three sequels on the Nintendo Entertainment System, where it evolved into a platform action game. Using Ryu's elite ninja skills, you had to slash, shoot, and climb your way through a 2D world on a mission to exact revenge on your father's killer. And it was especially notable for its stylized cinematic cutscenes, which were some of the first of their kind on a home console. Today, Ninja Gaiden is probably the most popular of all ninja game franchises, and it's all thanks to this. Team Ninja's reimagination of Ninja Gaiden on the Xbox brought ninjas to a whole new generation. Ryu once again had to seek revenge against everyone in iShot in the most spectacularly violent manner possible, and its combination of gorgeous visuals and super challenging gameplay made it one of the original Xbox's biggest hits. There are, of course, way too many ninja games out there to mention, ranging from the cute and crazy Legend of the Mystical Ninja, right through to the serious stealthing of the Tenchu series. So while they may not have cool stuff like parrots, buried treasure, or a crippling dose of scurvy, ninjas are definitely kings amongst video game heroes. Good game! Keeping with tradition, Nintendo continued to release a new version of every one of their major gaming franchises onto every one of their major gaming platforms. The latest to hit the Wii is Mario Kart. Breaking with tradition, we're actually getting this around the same time as the rest of the world. Armies of fanboys await shell-shocking banana blitzing bliss, but no amount of cartoon Japanese weaponry can stand up against the mighty rubber chicken. I'm big on Mario Kart badge, let's do this. Your eliteness intrigues me. Ah, oh, uh, 
I'm huge. Watch this is not helping. Oh. Down. Watch this. Oh, nice. oh, what a shame. What a shame. Oh, oh, he's in the tree. It's gonna happen again. Watch, watch. Every time I get, every time I get right next to you, I get knocked back. Well, that's because you're smaller. Because I'm, my guy's heavier than you. So you gotta. That's an advantage. Bang. Ah. Oh. Fails. <laughs> now, I noticed about half the tracks are actually retro remakes. Do you think this was lazy? You know, it didn't really matter to me whether it was Lazy Badge, because it's exactly what I wanted them to do. A large part of Mario Kart for me is nostalgia. And they've ported all the classic tracks from the SNES, 64, GameCube, and DS to include the new rules of this version. You can now do a trick off of every jump to get a boost when you land. And they've done some pretty interesting stuff with the existing level design, like half pipes. Bumping into signs is more unforgiving now, and because you're always stopped by enemies' weapons, acceleration has always been more important in Mario Kart than top speed. This is more balanced with carts having statistics like off-road, turbo, and drift. Also, smaller players get knocked about by the larger ones. New to the Wii version are bikes, which in general do have more acceleration. Bikes can pop wheelies for more speed, but while they do this, their turning is limited, and they're more vulnerable to bigger carts. New players will find the automatic slide works fine, but if you want those old school boosts, you're gonna have to go manual. Boosts are now done by how much you lean into your turn. If you hold the joystick towards your turn, the boost will come faster. Boosts are also shorter now, and they've done this to stop boost abusers. Oh, don't you mean skillful players? I think you'll find I mean boost abusers who slide boost throughout the whole track. And it's still possible to do this, but veterans will find that it's more about maintaining a boost through slides, turbos, and jump tricks. The slipstream is back, one of my favorite mechanics from the old Mario Karts. Spend a few seconds behind another player, and you'll get a significant turbo. There's also a few new weapons to deal with, including the Magic Bullet from the DS version and the Mega Mushroom. And for the first time, you can do all this online in battle or race mode if you've got an internet connection. There's also leaderboards. Yeah, how'd you find all that? Online was great, you know, you can choose from either worldwide or just your continent if you're worried about lag. Also, you can't actually exit a race, not even pushing the home button, and that means that no one's going to be able to drop out mid-race and cause online griefing. What about local multiplayer? There's a little bit of slowdown in four-player split-screen, you can tell the Wii is struggling. It's more noticeable in battle mode, and, you know, nobody likes a dodgy frame rate, Jung, but it doesn't really detract from the fun. But the big question to me, though, Badge, is do the motion sensing controls help or hinder the game? I think the controls were a worry for Nintendo, so they've just given you lots of different options, and this is the right strategy. You can use the Wiimote by itself, or with a nunchuck. There's also a wheel that comes with the game, which I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of fun with, but it makes it harder to do trick jumps and wheelies, forcing you to do a flick upwards like this, as opposed to just pressing a button. I found the wheel to be a little unresponsive, actually, but it was good not having pedals and, and the clutter of cables. Yeah, that's right. It didn't take me long to ditch it for the classic controller, but actually my personal favorite was the GameCube controller. I could be wrong here, but I think there's more unlocks here than any other Mario Kart game. There's heaps of cool tracks and carts to get. You can even unlock the ability to put your own me into the race. It would have been nice to have a tournament mode for multiplayer, though. I remember that from the old version. At the core of Mario Kart's fun is something known as a perpetual comeback system, which gives more powerful items to the racers in the back and basic ones to the racers in the front, and there's always a random element. The downside to this is that it's not actually fair. Generally, the more skilled player will win, but not always. The only guarantee here is fun. The perpetual comeback system always creates a mad, hectic dash for the finish line, and you'll have more close calls in a Mario Kart race than you will in any other game. Yeah, there's nothing quite like knocking someone off their first place position meters before the finish line. Love it. Final thoughts? Nintendo treats their characters with respect. If I was an outsider looking in on all this Mario Golf, Mario Tennis, Mario Kart, Mario Strikers, I would think it's all just money-grabbing franchise fodder. But the truth is, they're actually all top games. The Mario Sonic at the Limbo Games. No, no, that was the curse of Sonic. This is no exception. I'm giving it 9.5 out of 10 Star Power Chickens. If you played Mario Kart before, you'll pick this up immediately and start having fun with all the old school tracks. If you haven't played Mario Kart before, what are you doing? I'm giving it nine and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Good game. So gamers, did you guess the game? Or should we say the racing track that this game music is famous for? It was of course the theme from Rainbow Road. The last track in the final cup 
the special cup of every Mario Kart game so far. The first of these was Super Mario Kart, released in 1992 for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. The track is suspended in space and is hard because there are few or no rails to stop you falling into infinity. Since the Nintendo 64 version, Rainbow Road is the only racetrack to have a remixed version of the same theme tune. And that, gamers, brings us to the end of another episode. But before we go, we're thrilled to announce the winning idea for the Good Game Game competition, the game we're going to build together. It's Office Wars. You play as an average Joe or Jill in the average office. The aim of the game is to get promoted as fast as possible, and you will do just about anything to make that happen, no matter how deceitful, underhanded, or sneaky that may be. Congratulations to Troy, or as he's better known to us, Kenrak. Grats Kenrak and all the other finalists, and thank you to everyone who joined in the Good Game Game competition, of which there were well over 800 of you. If you want to have a look at Office Wars or the short list of other finalists, that's up on our website now. And over the next week or so, we'll be announcing who's going to be going to work with Infinite Interactive on the game, and also how you can be involved in the game's development process from here. Next week, it's not available in the country yet, but we get our hands on Rock Band. And it's one of the most innovative games we've seen in a while. Flow digitally distributes itself to the PSP. Plus the history of the first handheld console to have a color screen, the Atari Lynx. But now, we're history. Until next week, gamers, Bajo out. Junglist is the future.